Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazhar, and today is 13th April 2021. The day is Tuesday, and right now I am with the 11th Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Physics 5054. Uh, today we have set our hearts to solve May June 2012. Uh, one one paper. It's a MCQ paper, and uh, this belongs from the zone one, and we will try to make it easier for you. So let's start and, okay. So the today's paper we are working on is, uh, yeah. May, June, 2012, one, one paper. And it's a one hour paper and you have to attempt all of them. It will have 40 MCQs and you have to attempt all of them and you have to fill a bubble sheet and you wrote, note down your answers in a bubble sheet by shading. So, okay, so let's start today's paper. And question number, uh, question number one is showing on your screen now. You can see that uh, a manufacturer measures accurately the dimensions of a wooden floor tile. The approximate dimensions of the tiles are shown. Length is 0 0.4 meter, which means uh, 40 centimeter. The thickness is 0 0.005 meter, which means 0 0.5 uh, centimeter. And uh, the width is 0 0.08 meter, which means 8 centimeter. So, he wants us to uh, decide on the instruments which can be used to measure the length and the width and the thickness. The length, I think the length can be measured with the meter rule because it's 40 centimeter long. The width, which is eight centimeter long, a vernier caliper can be used to measure this length. The thickness, you can use the micrometer. So for thickness, use the micrometer. For the length, use the meter rule. And for the width, use the vernier caliper. That will be the best choices, I think. So I think the, the answer is A. So I think A is the right choice. Okay. So let's move to the question number. Uh, uh, the next question is question number two. Which pair of quantities include one scalar and one vector? One scalar and one vector. Uh, mass and time both are scalar, temperature and time both are scalar, temperature and velocity, yes. Temperature is scalar and the velocity is a vector quantity. So I think that the C is the right choice. So C is the right choice. Question number two. Okay. So uh, here we go. Uh, the speed time graph represents the journey of a car. The dots separate different sections of the journey. There are six different sections. There are six different sections. And how many sections represent the car moving with non uniform acceleration? You see, this is a speed time graph. And in the speed time graph, when the acceleration will be non uniform, the graph will be a curve. When the acceleration will be non-uniform, the graph will be a curve. If you have a good look at the, this graph, so here the graph is curved, means the acceleration is non-uniform. Here the graph is curved, which means the acceleration is non-uniform. So on two places, the, the graph is showing that the acceleration is non-uniform. So I think C is the choice. Question number three, C is the right choice. Okay. So the next question on your screen, a steel ball is released just below the surface of thick oil in a cylinder. During the first few centimeters of the travel, what is the acceleration of the ball? Constant and equals to 10 meters per second. That even don't happen in the free fall in the air. And constant, but less than 10 meters per second. The acceleration will not remain constant. Understand this, okay? Because when you are in the oil or when you are in the air and you are falling downward, as your speed will increase, the air resistance or the oil viscosity, uh, oil, not viscosity, oil uh, drag will increase when your speed will increase. So your acceleration is supposed to decrease. 
So C is decreasing. Acceleration should be decreasing whenever you have free fall. Your velocity increases, but your acceleration decreases. And in D is increasing. Increasing is wrong idea. So constant, constant. That's wrong idea for the acceleration and for a ball which is inside the oil. And increasing is also wrong idea. So the only right option left is C. So you see the question number uh, uh, four. C is the option. Uh, so let's move to the next part. Question number uh, next is uh, question number five is showing a hard stone hits the ground and comes to rest almost immediately. As the stone hits the ground, what is the direction and the size of the force acting on the ground? So when it will hit the ground, uh, the force will be uh, downward, obviously, and the force will be equal to weight. And uh, yeah, obviously it should be equal to weight. But you know the 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 stone it was moving when it was falling down. It was moving, so it has kinetic energy. So when it will hit the hit the ground because it has kinetic energy, so the force exerted on the ground will will be more than its weight. It's like if you if you have let's say you have a hammer. If you just touch the hammer with the with the ground, it's a different story. But if the hammer is moving and then it touch the ground, then the story is different. Because when it's moving and it touch and hit the ground, then it not just its weight will be acting downward, but but it will have the kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy will also provide a force. So the force should be downward and it should be larger than the weight of the stone. So I think B is the question number five. I think B is the right answer. Downward and larger than the weight. If the force acting uh, on the ground by this uh, hard stone, that will be not just equals to the weight. It will be more than the weight because when the stone hit the ground, it has a lot of kinetic energy. <clears throat> okay. So the next question on your screen is, Question number six. So the next question on your screen is question number six. He says that, uh, okay. A car of mass 1500 kg is towing a trailer of mass 1100 kg along a level road. The acceleration of the car is 1.30 meter per second square. Ignoring the friction and the air resistance, what is the driving force of the car? Very simple. You see, we have a car and with it, we have a trailer. Car is 1500 kg, the trailer is 1100 kg. So the total mass of both of them will be like 2600 kg. The acceleration the, the car is producing is 1.30 meter per second square. And you want to find out the, the driving force because there is no resistance, no, 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 no friction, no air resistance. So the driving force is the resultant force. And I can find it with the help of the Newton's second law of motion. The mathematical form of the Newton's second law of motion is F is equals to MA. F is equals to MA. The M is given, the A is given, F I can find out very easily. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. And let me show. So, okay, so this is here, which you can see the question number six, the M is the total mass will be 1500 plus 1100, 2600 kg. The A value is 1.30 meter per second square. F is equals to MA, so mass multiply acceleration. And the final answer will be 3380 Newton. Remember this number 3380 Newton. So let's go back. And uh, let's see what is the answer. Three, three, eight. So D is the right choice. So D is the right choice. I think D is the right choice. So hopefully you have understood this. Okay, so let's move. A beam pivoted at one end has a force of uh, five Newton. 
acting vertically down upwards on it as shown the beam is in equilibrium what is the weight of the beam so here you see here we have the pivot here we have that beam and this is the center of the gravity of the beam here its weight is acting the moment arm of this weight is 5 cm this weight of this beam is trying to produce a clockwise moment this 5 newton force which is acting upward its moment arm is 2 cm this 5 newton force is trying to produce a, a anti clockwise moment so the because this is in balance so the uh, clockwise moment is equals to the anti clockwise moment so weight multiply 5 cm equals to 5 multiply uh, 2 cm and you can find out the value of the weight i have done this on a paper let me show you my work okay so here you can see my work is showing that the clockwise moment is equals to the anti clockwise moment so weight multiply 5 cm equals to 5 newton multiply 2 cm so w will be equals to 5 into 2 divided by 5 so 5 5 will be cancelled so the answer will be 2 newton so the weight of the beam is 2 newton weight of the beam is 2 newton so let's check what is the option the weight of the beam is 2 newton so i think a is the right choice i think a is the right choice so let's move to the next part and the next part is question number 8 and the question number 8 is uh, showing on your screen four objects of equal mass rest uh four objects of equal mass rest on a table the center of mass of each table object is labeled g which object is the least stable we are looking for an object which is least stable you can underline this word because very important it could be more stable the question can be more stable also so but the question here is least stable the we will least stable will be that object whose base area is smallest and its center of gravity is highest center of mass is highest so clearly you can see with a little common sense the b is the answer question number 8 b is the right answer okay so here we go the next question little we need to reduce the size because you know this question cannot be seen properly now you can see right so here we go a 10 100 gram mass is suspended from a spring next to a vertical meter rule the top of the spring is leveled with the 0 degree centimeter mark the bottom of the spring is level with the 27.2 centimeter mark the 100 gram mass is replaced with a 600 gram mass the length of the spring is now 89.7 cm spring has not reached the limit of proportionality the 600 g mass is replaced with the 200 g mass what is the length of the spring this question is a very tricky question you see here i don't know i know the length of the spring when the mass uh, or the load which is hung is 100 g that's 27.2 cm length but i don't know the answer right then so uh, i will use the idea the change in the is the load and the extension i will work by like this so for example um, when there is a 100 g load the length of the spring is uh, 27.2 and then we replace the 100 and hung a 600 g mass now the length is 89.7 cm so i will check how much is the change in the load the change in the load is 600 minus 100 that is 500 and the extension will be 89.7 minus 27.2 you see in this question we don't have the unstretched length when there is no load so 100 centi 100 g whatever was the length when the load was 100 g i will use that okay so then he says i replace the load with the, with the 200 and in the 200 you will check the change in the load is 200 minus 100 that will be 100 let me show you my work then i will also explain this to you okay so uh, let's start the next one uh, i mean this question
Okay. So, so in, okay. So when the, when the, when the length, uh, when the hundred gram uh, uh, load is uh, hung, the length is 27.2 centimeter. And when the 600 gram load is hung, uh, 89.7 centimeter is the length. So change in load is 600 minus 100, that's 500 gram. And the extension, uh, due to this 500 gram extra weight, what, how much was the extension? That's 89.7 minus 27.2, 62.5 centimeter. So when you will put a 200 gram load there, so the change in the load will be 200 minus 100, that will be 100 gram. So then I will use the method of proportion, load extension, when I increase the load by 500 gram, extension of 62.5 was created. When I will increase the, I will change the load from 100 gram to 200 gram, how much will be the extension? That's the question. So 500 divided by 100 equals 62.5 divided by X. So X will be equals to 12.5 centimeters, simple mathematics. So the, the length when the load of 200 is hung, that will be the extension uh, when the load is 100, how much is the length and plus the extension. That's 27.2 plus 12.5. So it will be 39.7. 39.7 will be the length when you will hang 200 gram. So uh, I think that uh, it's a bit, bit difficult one. So try to understand this. If you cannot understand it, please watch that portion again. Uh, so 39.7 will be the new length. 39.7, what's the choice here? I think the C, C is the right choice. Sir. C, question number nine, C is the right choice. So next, let's uh, increase the size. A block of metal is taken from the earth to the moon. Which property of the block changes? You see the density will not change. The reason is the mass do not change and the volume do not change. The mass obviously do not change. Volume will not change. The one thing which on by going on the moon will definitely change is the weight. So question number 10, D is the choice. So the next question on your screen is uh, question number uh, 11. And the question number 11 says that, uh, question number 11, the diagram shows a mercury manometer connected to a gas container. And the density of the mercury is 13,600 kg per meter cube. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. What is the pressure difference between the gas in the container and the atmosphere? So that you see here, we have the gas here on the limb, which is uh, of the manometer, which is on the gas container side. The level of the mercury from the ground is 0 0.2 meter. And in, on the atmosphere side, the level of the mercury from the ground is 0 0.600 meter. So I can find out the actual difference between the levels in both the limbs. That is 0 0.6 minus 0 0.2, that will be 0 0.4 meter. I know the density of the mercury and I know the gravitational field strength, 10 Newton per kg. Then I can use the formula rho GH. Pressure is equal to rho GH and I can tell that the pressure. If I've done this on a paper, let me show you my work and then we will see. Okay. So, Let's increase the size, first of all. <coughs> so uh, difference in the level is 0 0.6 minus 0 0.2, the difference of level in the, both the limbs uh, of the mercury, 0 0.4 meter. Pressure is equal to rho GH, that rho, rho means density, and that's 13,600 G values, 10 Newton per kg, and the H value is 0 0.4 meter. Simply multiply them, that will be 54400 Pascal. 54400 Pascal. I hope you have understood this grammatical. Very easy. And that's it. 54400. So clearly, 
clearly C is the right choice. Question number 11, C is the right choice. Question number 11, C is the right choice. Okay. So here we have the next question on your screen. Uh, it says, Okay, so we have a partially inflated balloon is placed inside a bell jar. The bell jar is connected to an air pump. The air pump is switched on and the air is removed from the bell jar. What happens to the pressure and to the volume of the gas inside the balloon? You see, when you will remove the air around uh, the air which is in the bell jar around this balloon, when a vacuum will be created here or a low pressure is created here, the balloon, its volume will increase automatically. So when its volume will increase, so the pressure of the gas inside the balloon, that will decrease. So the pressure should decrease and the volume should increase. So I think question number 12, B is the right answer and B is the right answer. The pressure of the gas inside the balloon, that will decrease. The reason is the balloon will become bigger and bigger when it will become bigger it means the volume of the gas will increase so the pressure of the gas will definitely decrease so this is how you do question number 12 b is the right choice sir so let me do A ball is held at rest on one side of a curved track. The ball is released. It rolls down one side of the track and part of the way up the other side. It then stops before rolling back down again. The height of the stopping point is less than that of the starting point. What is the sequence of energy changes between starting and stopping for the first time? You see, it's a, it's a fact, it's a real life fact that when you, you let the ball roll from here, this is the height. On this other side, the ball will not reach the same height. It means that whatever the potential energy you have here, gravitational potential energy you have here, when the ball will roll and come up again, it will not get the same potential energy again. The reason, because there will be some energy losses. And, you know, because when this ball will be rolling down, it's, it's, it's gravitational potential energy. When it will roll here, it will have a little bit friction with the surface. So that gravitational potential energy will convert into heat and into the kinetic energy. So the energy which is converted into the kinetic energy, that can be recovered back in the form of the potential energy. But the energy which went into the thermal energy, when it overcame the friction between the surface and the ball, that is lost. So here you have the gravitational potential energy and when it rolls down, it energy converts into thermal energy due to overcoming of the friction and to into the kinetic energy. So when the ball is there, it has maximum kinetic energy that it rises upwards. So that kinetic energy back converts into the gravitational potential energy. But the problem is that it has friction here. So when it has friction here, so its energy will be converted into heat. So the, again, when it here, it will gain the gravitational potential energy, but that gravitational potential energy will be less than the gravitational potential energy the ball have here. Okay. So what are the energy changes taking place? That's why the ball cannot reach the same point, same height here, because it's not an ideal case. Uh, and the gravitational potential energy which you have here, the gravitational potential energy you have here is less. The reason is some energy has been lost. So I think that the potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy plus heat and from the kinetic energy back into the potential energy with some heat. And the heat which is produced that is lost to this now. So D is the choice. I think D is the right choice. 13 D is Okay. A transformer connected to a 240 volt main supply used to light a 24 watt lamp. The input current to the transformer is 0 0.11 ampere and the input voltage is 240 volt. The useful output power of the transformer is 24 watt. What is the efficiency of the transformer? P 
we know the output power that's 24 watt and on the input side i know the voltage i know the current so i can calculate the input power once i know the output useful output power and the total input power i can very easily calculate the efficiency of the transformer the formula is useful output power divided by the input power so let me show you my work i've done this on a paper so let's have a look and you see here we go i can increase the size so okay so input power is equals to the voltage in the primary multiply current in the primary that will be 240 multiply 0.11 26.4 watt so that's the input power the output power is given on the secondary side that's 24 watt so efficiency is equal to useful output power divided by input power multiply 100 so that will be 24 divided by 26.4 multiply 100 will be 90.5 percent which means 90 percent so if i write it like this i will write it like this if i want to write 91 percent in the decimal form it will be 0 0.91 0 0.91 0 0.91, I think B is the right option. I think B is the right option. Question number 14, B is the right option, sir. Okay. A gas is enclosed in a container of fixed volume. It gains heat energy from an external source. What happens to the molecules of gas? It gains heat energy from an external source. What happens to the molecule of gas? Because the volume is fixed, so they will not, they do not expand and they, they move further apart. No, they don't move further apart because the volume is fixed. They vibrate with a greater frequency. Uh, they are gas molecules, they are not vibrating, they are moving around. So they move faster because you have increased their temperature, volume is fixed. So what will happen now, they will be moving faster inside the container. Okay? So I think they move faster inside the container. So uh, question number 15, B is the right choice. B is the right choice. I think. Okay. So. So question number 15, B is the choice. We are moving to the next question. Question number 16 is on your screen. Four containers are filled with equal volume of water at the same temperature. Container A and B are shaded by a tree. Sunlight falls on the container C and D. From which container does all the water evaporate first? You see? The rate of evaporation will be faster if the sun is shining and the, if the surface area is the largest. And I think D is the best option. Question number 16, D is the best option because that container D has the largest surface area and it is uh, in the direct sunshine. So here the rate of evaporation will be faster. Okay. So question number 16, D is the choice. Okay, the next question on your screen is question number 17. A metal rod is, is a metal of rod, a rod of metal is heated at one end. Which statement best describes the conduction of heat through the metal? Through the metal, the vibration of the particles also takes place and by the vibration of the particles, the energy is transferred from one place to the other place. Plus, the metal has another very important aspect that it has free electrons. And the free electron diffusion takes place. The free electrons move from the heart because the free electrons, they can flow in the body of the solid metal from one end to the other end. And what happens? 
from the hot end they will absorb the energy and they will go to the cold end and they will collide with the atoms there and they will translate the, uh, transfer their energy to the atoms on the cold end so i think the best description can be free electrons move from the hot end and hit the atoms further along the road that can be the answer a part is atom move from the hot end no in conduction the atoms don't move atoms vibrate and hit atoms at the cold end uh, yeah Oh, as a free electrons, uh, I'm reading the D part. Free electrons vibrate and pass. Free electrons don't vibrate. So C is the best option. Free electrons move from the hot end and hit the atom further along the road. Yes, that's right. I think question number seventeen C is the right answer. Question number seventeen C is the right answer. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. That is question number seventeen, and it says. Uh, many gas appliances such as ovens and heaters use a small flame to ignite the main burner. To make sure that the small flame is burning, a temperature measuring device is inserted into the flame. What is the most suitable device to use? A clinical thermometer? That clinical thermometer cannot be put in a flame directly. A mercury thermometer? That can also not be put in. You cannot put this in directly into a flame. A thermocouple thermometer? Yes, this is possible. A water manometer, I don't think. Uh, a water a thermocouple thermometer. C is the best answer. Thermocouple is used for this kind of tasks. Okay. Question number 19 is on your screen. And uh, a hot liquid is allowed to cool. The graph shows the cooling curve. No, so it was a liquid, it was hot, and it's cooling curve we have shown here. So in which part of the curve is the latent heat release? Whenever the cooling curve will, will become flat, it means that a state change is taking place because the thing was the liquid. So at the Q, from Q to R, the, the cooling curve is flat, which means a state change is taking place. So during Q and R, the liquid is converting into the solid, so the latent heat is released. From Q to R. So I think B is the right choice. Question number 19. I think B is the right option. Question number 19. B is the right answer. We have the next question. For the same temperature rise and the same original volume, which of the three states of matter expand the most and which state expands the least? You see, the gases will expand the most and the solids expand the least. That is a fact and that is a part of your stabus also. This is a fact that the gases will expand most and the solids will expand least. So A is the choice. Question number 20, A is the choice. <clears throat> The speed of radio wave is C, a radio station transmits waves with a wavelength lambda. What is the frequency of the transmission? You know the frequency of that uh, V is equals to F lambda. V equals to F lambda. So F will be equals to V divided by lambda. If the V is represented with the speed, speed of light, C, then the frequency will be equals to C divided by lambda. C divided by lambda. So clearly A is the choice. Question number 21, A is the right choice. Question number 21, A is the right choice. Okay. Now, light is incident on a mirror and is reflected as shown. What is the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection? You see, uh, here, it's a straight line. Okay. So first of all, I will, I will, I will check how much is this angle. So this is a straight line. This line and this dotted line is a straight line. This angle is 80. So this angle here, it should be 100. 180 minus 80. So it should be 100 because this is a straight line. So if this angle is 100, this angle includes angle of incidence and angle of reflection. 
so divide that 100 in because angle of incidence and the angle of reflection they both are always equal so divide that 100 into two parts so each angle will be of 50 50 so the angle of incidence will be 50 and the angle of reflection will be also 50 so you see the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection they both will be 50 50 so let's move to the next part. So I think uh, D is the choice. Question number 22, D is the right choice. Okay, so we have the next question. And the next question is, light is incident on one face of a glass block at an angle of incidence of 40 degree. The glass block is in air. The refractive index of the glass is 1.46. What is the angle of the refraction inside the glass block? So um, angle of incidence in the air is 40. The refractive index, which we represent by N, that is 1.46. And the angle <clears throat> of refraction, they want you to find out. So we will use the Snell's law, sine I by sine R equals to N. And so it will be sine 40 divided by sine R equals to 1.46. And you can do the calculation. So I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my working. So here we go. So the next question, I hope you can see this. Question number 23, the value of the N is given 1.46, I value is 40, R value is question. Sine I by sine R is equals to N, sine 40 divided by sine R equals to 1.46. So sine R will be equals to sine 40 divided by 1.46. So do this calculation on your calculator, it will give you the 0 0.4402. That R, make the R alone, the sine will go on the other side, it will become sine inverse. So on your calculator, take the shift sign 0 0.4402 equals to the answer will be 26.1 degrees. So the angle of refraction will be 26.1 degree. Angle of refraction will be 26.1 degree. So I think A is the choice. Question number 23, A is the right choice. A is the right choice. A is the right choice, question number 23. Okay, so we are moving to the next part and the next part is... <sighs> okay, question number 24. In a short-sighted eye, you know, whenever a person is short-sighted, he can see the near objects clearly, but the far or far away objects he cannot see clearly. The reason is because his eye lens is bending too much. He's bending the rays too much. So what it do? It bends the light, light, laser, uh, light rays before the retina. It focuses them before the retina. So you are only able to see the object clearly if the, the light is focused on the retina. So if the light is focused before the retina, you will not be able to see the clear ob objects clearly. To, to, to correct this uh, problem, we use a concave lens, a diverging lens. So whenever a person is short-sighted eye, light from the distance object is not focused on the retina, where this light focus and what type of lens is needed to correct the problem. The light is focused in front of the retina, uh, because your eye lens is bending too much, uh, is bending the light too much. And we to correct this, we use diverging lens. So clearly D is the choice. Question number 24, D is the right choice. Question number 24, D is the right choice. D means this, this D choice. Okay, so let's go. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> question number 25. He says, uh, below are four statements about the uses uh, of electromagnetic radiation. Gamma rays are used in the medical treatment. That is true. Infrared waves are used in the sun belt. That's wrong. UV light is used in the sun belts. So one statement, the second statement is wrong. Microwaves are used in the satellite television, that is true. Axes are used in the intruder alarms, that is wrong. Uh, uh, you know, infrareds are used in the intruder alarm. 
How many of these statements are correct? I think only two are correct. The gamma rays are used in the medical treatment and the microwaves are used in the satellite television. These two statements are correct. So only two statements are correct. So clearly the B is the choice. Question number 25B is the right choice. Question number 25B is the right choice. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So uh, two straight electrical conductors are parallel to one another. Each carries the current one into the plane of the paper and one out of the plane of the paper. Which diagram shows the magnetic field around the two wires? As you see, we are talking about the straight conductors who are carrying current and around them magnetic fields are produced. The magnetic field lines are uh, in the circular concentric circles. And if you want to find out the direction of the magnetic field lines, you can use the right hand rule for the straight conductor. So dot means that the current is coming out of the page and the cross means that the current is going into the page. For example, if I look at the A diagram, the dot is, it means that the current is coming. So if I hold that in my right hand, so uh, my thumb is pointing in the direction of the current and the curves of my finger, they are showing me the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field should be uh, anti-clockwise. So the anti-clockwise thing has been correct. But the when in the second, uh, the, this one, the second uh, wire, where the current is going into the page, you see when the current is going into the page, my thumb, my curls of the finger, the curls of my finger, they are telling me that the direction of the, of the, of the, you know, magnetic lines, they should be clockwise and they are clockwise, but there is a problem. You see, let me show you the problem later. Here clearly uh, the current is coming out in the B. If you look at this diagram, it's wrong because when I apply the right hand rule for the straight conductor, my curls, uh, the, the curls of my finger tell me that the direction of the magnetic sh field should be anti-clockwise. But here he has shown it clockwise so that B is rejected, it's gone. And if you look at the C diagram, the current is coming out in, in the right uh, conductor, so it should have a magnetic field around it, which should be anti-clockwise, that is right. And this one, the current is going into the, into the paper, the direction of the magnetic field line should be clockwise, that is right. And in the middle, because the magnetic direction of the magnetic field um, due to the both the conductors is same, same. So in the middle, the magnetic lines will be very, very close to each other. So in the middle, the magnetic lines will be very close to each other. So in the middle, the magnetic field will become very strong. So C is actually the right answer. So when here in the middle, it will become very strong on the sides, the magnetic field will be not that strong. So what will happen? These two wires, they will move away from each other. That's why we have made a thumb rule that if you have two straight conductors and in them, the direction of the current is opposite. So they will repel each other. If in the straight conductors, the direction of the current is in opposite direction, they will repel each other. And if the current is in the same direction, they will try. So for repulsion, this diagram is the best because in the, in the middle of between both the wires, the magnetic field is very strong and on the side, sides, the magnetic field is weaker. So they will move away from each other. C is the actual choice, actual answer. And let's check what else we have here. You see, if you have put a dot, the magnetic field should be uh, anti-clockwise. So that is right. Here, the field is coming uh, out uh, into the page. So it should have been uh, clockwise, but here they have shown anti-clockwise, so B is also wrong. So the only right option possible here is C. A was also, to some extent, to some extent, you see, the A was also to some extent right, but it has not shown here that in the middle, the magnetic lines will come close to each other and the magnetic field will be very strong. So that's why we rejected A, question number 26, C is the right choice. Question number 26, C is the right choice.
Okay. A polythene rod is rubbed with a duster. The duster then attracts small pieces of paper. Are the rod and the duster charged or uncharged? When you rub them with each other, if one of them, uh, because they will have friction with each other, and they both are, uh, uh, you know, insulator, and when you rub two insulators together, due to the friction, they become charged. So rod will become charged and the duster will also become charged. They both will be charged. So I think question number 27, A is the choice. The voltage current graph of a filament Voltage current graph for a filament lamp is shown on the y-axis, we have the voltage, on the x-axis, we have the current. The voltage across the lamp decreases when what happens to the temperature of the lamp and the resistance of the lamp. So, you know, uh, V and I, V is on the y-axis, I is on the x-axis. If you will find the slope of this graph, that will be V divided by I. The slope of this graph will be V divided by I. And you can see that the slope is gradually increasing. V divided by I is equal to the resistance. R is equal to V divided by I. So the slope here represents the resistance. And if the slope is gradually increasing, it means the resistance is increasing. So it's a filament lamp. So you see when you provide it with more voltage and more uh, current, its temperature also rises. And when its temperature increases, its resistance will also increase. So both of them, temperature and the resistance, they both increases. D is the choice. Question number 28, D is the choice. You see when the more voltage and more current is provided, the, the filament becomes more, uh, it glows more and it produces more heat and its resistance is more. Temperature will increase and the resistance will also Increase. Question number 28, D is the right choice. A 12 volt battery is connected across a parallel arrangement of two resistors. Uh, what is the reading on the amp? Very easy. These two are connected in parallel to each other, so I can find out their equivalent resistance. One by R equivalent is equal to one by R1 plus one by R2. Once I know the equivalent resistance for the whole circuit, then I can find out the amount of current coming from the battery. EMF is 12 volt. So I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. <coughs> So here you can see one by R equivalent is equal to one by six plus one by three. So it will be like the three by six. So that's one by two, you cross multiply. So R equivalent will be two ohm. So once I know that equivalent resistance, I can easily find out the current coming from the battery. And that is EMF divided by the R equivalent. That is equal to I, I will be equal to 12 divided by two and six ampere. So the current coming from the battery is six ampere, question number 29, I think. Uh, question number 29D is the right choice. Okay, the question number 30 is on your screen and they what this. They say, <clears throat> the circuit shown is set up and then all the switches are closed. One switch is then now open and all the lamps are lit. Means by opening that switch, no lamp goes off. Everything is good. So if all the switches were closed, A switch, B switch, C switch, D switch, and lights were on, and then he says, I opened one switch and there is no effect on the lights and that will be none other than B. You can see, if I open this, the other lights, they are not affected. If A, C, and D are closed, 
and I keep the B open, nothing will happen to the light. They will keep on shining. They will be lit. So B is the right choice. Question number 30, B is the right choice. By opening this B switch, not, uh, the lighting of this three lamp is not right. A lamp connected to a 12 volt supply converts energy at a rate of 36 watts. How much energy will be converted in the 10 seconds? How much energy? So if you know the power and you know the time very easily, you can find out the, uh, the energy. Energy is equal to power multiplied time. The power should be in the watts and the time should be in the, the time should be in how much? Sorry. The time must be in the seconds. So let me show you my work. Okay. So the power is 36 watts. The voltage is 12 volt. The time is 10 seconds. Energy is question. Energy is equal to power multiplied time and 36 watt multiplied 10 and it will be 360 joules. 360 joules. So 360 joules, check the answer. 360 and the D is the answer. Question number 31, D is the right choice. What causes the fuse to blow in a main electric circuit? A person touches the live, that can be an answer. A person touches the neutral wire, no. A live, the live wire touches the earth wire, that is 100% that is the thing. The neutral wire touches the earth wire. Neutral wire touches the earth wire. Nothing will happen. So I think the A and the C has the competition. But if you pay a little more attention, a person touches the live wire. I might be wearing a rubber shoes and I touch the live wire. Nothing will happen to me. So that A cannot be the answer. The live wire touches the earth wire. That is definitely this is when the current starts going to the ground through the earth wire. And the supply of the current from the main supply increases and the, the due to the surge of the current, the uh, fuse will melt. So C is the right answer. Question number 32, C is the right answer. Question number 33. A current carrying wire is placed between the poles of a magnet. What is the direction of the force on the wire due to the current? You see, um, here we have a magnetic field and that magnetic field is from north to south. So here is from left to right. And there we have a conductor and the current of the conductor is from positive to negative. It's conventional current. So I can apply the left hand rule, stretch your fingers of the left hand in such a way that the thumb and the index finger and the middle finger with the left hand rule so let me stretch my fingers the the magnetic field is from north to south the current is coming towards me my thumb is pointing upward so it means that the, the direction of the force will be a so the direction of the force will be a question number 33 a is the right answer okay so let's move to the next part it's uh, a simple dc motor okay he says a simple DC motor consists of a coil that rotates between the poles of a permanent magnet. The turning effect is increased by winding the coil on a metal cylinder. Which metals are used to make the magnet and the cylinder to make the permanent magnets? We use steel and to make the core or for that uh, coil, we use iron, soft iron. So I think D is the choice. Question number 34, D is the choice for magnet. I will use steel and for the cylinder on which I will find the wire, that cylinder is made up of soft iron. So D is the choice, question number 34, D is the right choice. Okay, so let's move to the next part. Question number 35 is showing on your screen. Okay. 
the current is produced when a wire is moved between two magnets as shown so you see here we have a conductor placed inside a magnetic field if i will move the this conductor uh, perpend if i move it perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field emf for the current will be induced in this coil which device uses this effect as a, a generator we use this principle this thing this phenomena in the generator so very easy thing a very easy question to answer question number 35 b is the right answer this is used in a generator this is used in a generator okay so b was the choice <clears throat> Ooh. Why is the transformer used to connect a generator in a power station to a long distance transmission lines? Because we use a step step up transformer there, and we increase the voltage and the current is decreased to reduce the power losses in the transmission line. The voltage is increased, the current is decreased, and this helps to reduce the power losses in the transmission line. To increase the voltage and decrease the current. So C is the right choice. Question number 36, C is the right choice. Which electrical component is used to store charge? We know I told you this, that uh, for that purpose we use capacitor. Capacitor is a device which is used to store electric energy and which is used to store the charge. So capacitor, very simple question. 37A is the choice. We use, uh, we use capacitor. We use capacitor. 37A is the choice. A radioactive isotope, radium-226, may, uh, may be shown as radium-88-226. How many protons does an atom of radium contain? Radium will have 88 protons. It's, very simple. it's the simplest question possible. How many protons does an atom of radium contain? 88. 88 protons. B is the choice. Question number 30. Um, 8B is the choice. Question number 39 is on your screen. When dealing with the radioactive materials, there are possible dangers. Which statement is correct? Beta particles can pass through the skin and damage the body cells. That is true. Their penetration power is good, so they can pass through the skin. Material that emit only alpha particles must be kept in thick lead container. That is wrong. Any radioactive material, they should be kept in a lead thick, thick lead container. Radioactive materials are safe to handle after two half lives. That's wrong. Sources of gamma radiation are dangerous because they have long half life. Um, we are not sure about the long, long half lives. Does not depend upon the particles, uh, which kind of particle is coming out. Sources of gamma radiation are dangerous because they have long half-life. Even if their half-life is short, they still will be very dangerous. So uh, beta particles can pass through the skin and damage the body cells. That looks the best answer. So question number 39A is the choice. Question number 39A is the best answer. Okay, so here we go. Question number 40, an isotope is radioactive and has a half-life of four years. A simple, a sample, sorry, initially contains 8,000 atoms of X. So after how many years will the sample contain 100 atoms of X? You see the half-life is four years. So I will, after, after four years, the, the counting of the atoms that will become half. So how much atoms you have? 8,000, so after one, uh, four years, uh, 4,000 atoms will be left. When another four years have passed, only 2,000 atoms will be left. 
when another four years have passed, only 1,000 atoms will be left. I have made a grid. And let me show you the grid. So, uh, dear students, I think you can see that. Uh, let me increase the size. Bring it. Now it says that the, at the, when the when when we started the observation, the reading was eight thousand. There were eight thousand atoms of that radioactive sample. Half life is four years, so one half life passed, it will become half four thousand. When another half life has passed, four thousand will have it will become two thousand. When another half life has passed, two thousand will have and it will become one thousand. So you can see that how many half life one, two, three half life. Total 12 years have passed and the sample has dropped from 8,000 to 1,000. Rest of them has decayed. And so that's clearly, let me check what is the answer. The C is the choice. What is the choice? C is the right choice. Question number 40, C is the right choice. 12 years have passed, three half lives have passed. So that's it, G. Uh, today we have done uh this was the uh, mcq paper and today i have done i think uh, may june 2012 the paper we did today the paper we did today is uh, Okay, so my dear students, uh, today we have done May, June 2012 paper, and today we have done one one paper. This will, this was an MCQ paper, and that belongs from the zone one. And uh, I think uh, I have tried my best to explain to you the concepts, how I decide on an option. So hopefully this video is helpful to you. If you find this video helpful to you, and this video has made your life a little easier when you're practicing the past paper. Kindly don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Also press the bell icon so that uh, whenever I upload a new video, you get the notification. Don't forget to press the like buttons also. Feel free to comment whatever you feel like, please comment. And that's an energy for us and energy for me, especially to make these videos and to write the paperwork and then make the video. It's not an easy work. And uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Don't forget to recommend these videos to your friends so they can also benefit. And by sitting in their homes, by just looking at our YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, channel, they can practice their uh, physics, past papers. And one very important thing I can tell you one idea that you see if you are watching these videos on your mobile uh, cell phones, then it, it might not be that useful to you because the screen is very short and you are not able to see it clearly. If I show you my uh, uh, view, you see I have attached uh, this with, uh, you can see that, you see I have attached this with, uh, with a big screen. And I watch these videos and these lectures on this big screen. If you will do this also, then you will enjoy these lectures. The one problem which with online, uh, the online thing is that we are, we are only, uh, our students are watching thus these, these lectures on their cell phones. So when they are watching their, uh, when they are watching these lectures on the cell phone, the screen is very small. So after some time they get bored. But if you, you everybody has now smart and it is at their homes, just attach your devices or your, your desktop with that LED and watch these lectures on the big screens. Then it will become, if you watch these lectures on the big LEDs, then the lecture will be interesting to you. So uh, thank you very much and everybody have a good day and God bless you all.